Thank you for jumping on to see this um, service here for March 13th. Um, this particular service I am dedicating actually to a friend of mine who's gone on to be with the Lord. His name is Marcus Darnell Eason. A um, friend of mine that I grew up with has gone, what we would say much too soon. He's only 45 years old and he's gone home to be with the Lord, but father makes no mistakes and he has called him right on time. But I um, thought about him when I was make when I was writing this message. Um, I attended yesterday his home going um, with my family. And I realized then I've known him for 37 years, or I had known him before he went home to be with the Lord, 37 years. And we would have so many conversations um, over the phone when we were just uh, preteen, preteens, early teenager, 11, 12, 13 years old. And we talk about the ministry and we, were, we went to church together. And so we talk about ministry and we talk about the Lord and growing in the Lord and the call that was on our lives. And we talked about it not knowing the call that God had on our lives, but we knew that there was something different about us. There was just something different. We couldn't put our finger on it, but there was something different. Now, looking back, I realize it was because we were called to ministry and ministering in different ways. And so we had these phone calls and, and I appreciate them now. And I appreciate that we were different. And I felt like even in my groups of friends that I never quite fit in and couldn't put my finger on it. But when I got home um, from the funeral yesterday, I was reading the headlines, um, the news headlines. And there was a story about a young man in high school in Nevada who had to take a class in order to graduate called the sociology of change. And in this class, he was to admit or to confess that he had a white dominance, okay? First of all, he's multicultural, he's multiracial, biracial, biracial. And so there's not a white dominance, so to speak. There's not a privilege, so to speak. But they forced him to confess this, and because he wouldn't, they failed him. The, the, um, they gave him a failing grade, which would mean that his graduation, that it should be in the next couple months, would not happen. And so I'm sure we won't hear the end of this case because it is very unfair to try to get him to force something upon himself or to have others try to force something upon him. The school and the administrators of that school just don't understand who he is. They don't understand his background. And so they want to try to make him into something else or make him to, into somebody that they can understand. Now, there have been people in my life who've done the same thing because I've been a little bit different and they've tried to lock me into a box. And I know that that has happened to other people. And so that's what this message is about. So I'm going to go ahead and, and now um, let you join the rest of this message. But I just wanted to give kind of a, a preamble of what this message is about. And we're going to talk about a young lady in the Bible named Ilka. We only see her once in Genesis eleven twenty nine. 29. So let's jump on to the word right now and learn about Ilka and how important it is for us to not be concerned with what other people think about us and if they don't understand us. God bless you. And I hope you enjoy this message. There's this, um, here's the, here's the family tree right here. Can everyone see the family tree that's there? You can see that? Okay. All right. So if we look at this family tree, then we see that there is Iska. Can you see my cursor here moving? Okay, so here's Iska right over here. And again, Genesis eleven twenty nine 29 says, and Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iska. And again, here's Iska over here. So you see Haran. Haran is a brother of Abram, Nahor, and Sarah. They're all children of Terah, all right? Terah is the father of all of them. So going back over to Haran's um, side here, you've got Haran is the father of Lot, Milcah, and Iscah, all right? Now let's look at the other two real quick. Let's look at Lot. 
we know from the story of Lot and um, Sodom, when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, when Sodom was des destroyed, it was Lot's wife who looked back when the Lord said, don't look back. And she was made into what they said, uh, they called a pillar of salt. Now we know now that that was a volcano and it was ash is basically molten ash is what she, she turned into because that, that um, uh, volcano got to her. Um, so they had two daughters and we know that because in the same story, we know that Lot offered up his daughters to the stranger. So Lot had two daughters and he had a wife. If we go over to Milka, right over here, his sister, Milka was married to Nahor, which yes, that was her uncle. It was different back then. They were still replenishing the earth. So Milka was married to Nahor. All right. And then they had children, right? And then you go over to Iska and there's nothing. Iska had no children. She had no spouse, at least at this point in history. And, and this is all we know of her because she only appears in this one verse in the entire Bible. And all we know about her is that she's the daughter of Haran. But there's no husband, there's no children, which is very different during that time period, okay? Even the daughters were, Lot's daughters at the, during this time were already slated or promised to someone. They had fiancés, but Iska had no one and we don't hear about her anymore. So again, thinking about what I was just saying about myself and my friend Marcus, whose funeral I attended, and then this young man in Nevada who was misunderstood as well, Iska is misunderstood. There's not a lot we know about her. So she has been misunderstood throughout history. She's different, okay? She's different than most everyone else here on this um, chart, at least, but she's definitely different than everyone else in her direct lineage. So because she's different and because she's only mentioned once in the entire Bible, people throughout history have tried to turn her into something that they could better understand because otherwise there's something that we don't know. And I think we can acknowledge once we get to a point in Christ that there is not everything. We don't know everything. Our thoughts are not like God's thoughts. He doesn't see like we see. We can't see like he sees. He knows all and he is all. Okay. And so Iska here we don't quite understand everything about her. We don't know much about her at all, except that she was a daughter of Haran. And again, as such, people have tried to lock her into a box that they can better understand. Amen? There are so-called scholars, some that are, are not well known and some that are very well known that it's quite surprising even when you get into Josephus who is a very well known scholar of iniquity um biblical iniquity at that um they have even tried to make her into something that clearly she's not we have scholars who have tried to claim that Iska is actually Sarah okay that this is just another name for Sarah which makes no sense at all <laughs> Really, when you think about this, again, here's Sarah over here. Now, where it's true that we can say it, and it has been said, not only in the Bible, but in history and in, in um, genealogies, we could say that even if Sarah were Tara's granddaughter, she could be called a daughter. But we know that this could not be Sarah because Iska is Abraham's niece. Okay? Iska is Abraham's niece. And Abraham at, at one time in Genesis directed Sarah to say when they got to a certain place that she was his sister and not his wife. Remember that was lies by omission because he was afraid of losing his life. He was afraid they would kill him and then try to take Sarah for themselves. But he wouldn't have directed Sarah to say it's his sister if this was actually Tara's granddaughter if that were actually his niece so this can't be Sarah Iska can't be Sarah it makes no sense at all some even go so far when you get into some of the more um, rabbinic writings and um, Jewish mystical writings they try to say that Iska is Sarah's alter ego now this is so far-fetched right here 
that Iska is Sarah's alter ego and that because she was a sayer or she was into fortune telling that she takes on that Sarah takes on this alter ego of Iska when she's in the process of um, a prophetic word or in the midst of fortune telling. Now, see, Iska's name means one who looks forth, okay, or means one who sees out. So this quite possibly could just mean that she had a prophetic gifting. You know, people were named for a reason. They were named according to the calls that were on their lives. And, and people put a lot more thought into names than we seem to do now. And so it could have been that she just had a prophetic gifting. Again, the name means um, one who looks forth or one who sees out, which would easy, easily explain why her life's journey was atypical anyway that her life journey may not have been the same as Milka or Sarah or any of the other um, women who walked the face of the earth back then. But again, people have tried to change her and make her become something that they can understand, um, someone to whom they can better relate. If anyone here can identify this, then I have to tell you a few things. First of all, is there anyone here who can identify with this, can identify with being misunderstood in any way, or can identify with someone or some people may um, try to lock you in a box or may not understand that you are more creative than someone or your thoughts are not like someone's thoughts or because you're in a certain culture, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that. But somehow that doesn't really jive with who you are. Is there anyone who feels like that today or who has felt like that in any time of their life that they may not have been totally understood? I've already expressed that I was one, <laughs> Brother Jimmy, Reverend DeMont, amen? Amen, amen. So again, I wanna share just a few things. First of all, you're in good company, amen? We have people throughout the word of God who were misunderstood. Amen. God puts them in there and has left them in there for a reason. There are countless individuals throughout history who made a mark on this world and who were different. Amen. Who um, the world attempted to diminish or diminish what, what God made them to be. Amen. God made us all individuals for a reason. So we have to remember that our purpose in this life, God's plan and purpose for your life requires you to be different. Even if you're able to walk a more um, patterned life or a straighter line than a lot of people, you're still different. There are no two people on this planet that are exactly the same. And that is a beautiful thing. That just shows you how much God loves you and how much he appreciates you and how much he wanted to make you just a little different. Now, people say, and they, they've, I've heard it all my life, people say everyone has a twin somewhere on the earth, right? That there's someone that you look a lot like. And that's probably true, amen? But even if you're an actual twin, there's still something different, something unique, something that God intricately, intricately designed in you. And that should put a big smile on your face because it shows you how much God loved you just to make you an individual. And not only are you an individual, but he knows every single hair on your head. He knows you inside and out, backward and forward because he loves you just that much. Your walk on this earth, your journey, your purpose in life, your God-given purpose in life requires you to be different in some way. So if you're misunderstood, then fine. Amen. We should always anticipate being misunderstood on some level or not being well received on some level. Amen. It may be a bit uncomfortable and sometimes it may even be hurtful. We think about this, it's especially in regard to children, that they may be different and, and kids may be a little bit mean to each other sometimes, but it doesn't get much better when you become an adult. Amen. It really doesn't. And so it may be uncomfortable sometimes, it may be hurtful at times, but it brings us to a place of humility and to a new level of freedom once we welcome our God-given individuality. We've got to welcome that individuality. It's not for everyone to comprehend. It's not your job to get them to comprehend. 
That's not our purpose. We waste a lot of time when we get, we try to get people to accept us for who we are. There is a um, YouTuber that I follow and I've been following her probably for about a year and a half now. And the reason that I followed her is because I, I start actually two years, I think, because I started following her um, when we were maybe longer than that, when we were thinking about getting back on the road, um, full-time RVing. And so this is while we were still um, fixing up our the old RV that we had before we got the newer one. And we were kind of designing it for full-time living as opposed to just the, the part-time, uh, not even part-time, but just the little vacations we were going to take here and there. And so I've started following her because she's a van dweller. What she did was she got a an old Volkswagen um, RV. The the I call them the it's the one that you see people who go to Grateful Dead concerts a lot. They take those those vanigans. That's what they're called, vanigans. Those Volkswagen um, vans. And she was fixing it up, and she showed her whole process. And she's been on the road for several years now. So I caught her late um, in the game and had to look at all of the old videos. But she put out a video um, probably four days ago, four or five days ago. And she was just crying and crying and crying in this video. Now, each time she puts out a video, she's happy and she's bubbly. And, you know, she's all over the place. She lives in... Um, in Europe, um, she is. She visited China. Her so she's she's Chinese. Her family is from China, and she visited there a couple times. But she speaks fluent German and a number of other languages because she's kind of been all over Europe throughout her life. And she wanted to actually just go out and live this way, and so she's done it for a number of years. But she was extremely distraught and crying, um, and the pain was just very evident. You know. Um, that she spoke with her parents and she said she just wanted to be accepted by her parents. That in the rest of her family, um, you're either told you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever profession you're going to go into, you're told as a child that this is what you're going to do. And all of your studies and everything else are um, created or they're designed to get you to that point. So this is just what happens in her family. And so this just didn't fit her. She just did not fit that mold. And so she felt already like she was ostracized in a sense because it just wasn't what she wanted to do. Now she's independent financially. She takes care of herself. She's got a home that she owns that she rents out as an Airbnb. And that's how she um, affords her, her um, can't, or what am I trying to say? Her, um, what am I trying to say? Her lifestyle, I can't think of the word right now, her nomadic lifestyle. And so she's able to afford that by way of the, the income that comes from her home, her Airbnb. And so they don't understand that. And they're telling her, you know, you're too old for this now. We let this go for a couple of years. Um, you can't keep living like this. You're supposed to be married by now. You should have children by now. And what blew me away is she said, um, they told her, you're 27 years old. You're too old. For this. And it's just trying to, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's 27. Brother Jimmy. Oops. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, wow. Okay. So she's not understood in that. And because she's not understood and because there are people who want to lock her in this particular box, um, it's caused a lot of hurt for her and it's caused a lot of pain. And so many won't understand you because they aren't you. Amen. They won't understand everything about you because they aren't you. And if you begin to feed into their misunderstanding, you'll in turn be losing yourself. And ultimately, you'll lose the call of God on your life. Amen. Your journey is not contingent upon anyone else understanding it. Your purpose in God, your purpose in this walk on this earth is not contingent upon anyone else understanding it. And the, the tee hee hee of the whole thing is that as well, your journey is not even contingent upon you understanding it. <laughs> Amen. God made us a certain way because he knows the end to the beginning. He knows what our end result will be. Of course, it's victory, but he knows the intricacies of that end result. 
He knows what he wants you to accomplish in this world. He knows what purpose he wants you to fulfill in this world. And he's created you as such. Now, we have to remember that the enemy comes to still kill and destroy. That's his job. And he does his job well. Don't become your own enemy by trying to be what everyone else wants you to be or even to be what you think you're supposed to be and then end up um, ruining the call of, of God on your life because you are so interested in, in being normal, so to speak. You're so interested in fitting in that you box yourself out from the desires and the purpose and the plan of God for your life. We don't ever want to do that. Amen. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to what? Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So that's saying right there, we're not to even lead on our own understanding, even in regard to us. That can mess us, mess us up and put us in a trick bag that we don't want to be in. Lean not unto our own understanding, but trust in him. And he'll give us the information that we need in order to, to get to the place that he has designed for us to be. So the bottom line is don't worry about being misunderstood. In wellness ministry on Thursday afternoon, we went through the story of Hannah. And we talked about when Hannah was, was uh, mouthing her prayer to God in the temple. And even Eli, the high priest, misunderstood her. He thought that she had been drinking, that she was inebriated when she was not. She was mumbling to him, but she was not. She was speaking from her heart directly to God, knowing that audibly she didn't need to be heard by God. He was listening to her heart. So Hannah was misunderstood. David was misunderstood by his brothers. Remember, he was just this little ruddy boy who liked to skip rocks and play the harp. Amen. But think about some of the wonderful things that came from, from that. We just heard the ancient Hebrew version of Psalms one, Psalm 104 sung in that ancient Hebrew, the way David wrote it. Was that, did that sound like a weak little boy who wrote something that just my gosh, that magnificent and that powerful. But his big brothers didn't understand him because all they could understand was doing big, bold, manly stuff, so to speak. Not skipping rocks and, 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 and playing a harp. But they didn't call, God didn't call on any one of them to slay Goliath. It was David because again, and I said this before, when he was practicing throwing and skipping those rocks and making sure they go in a, a perfect um a perfect direction and there was enough velocity behind it to make the sound that he wanted, that he was, he was actually training to be able to hit that perfect place on Goliath that took him down. Amen. But his brothers didn't understand that. David probably didn't even understand that because if you're the little guy in the family, amen, and your big brothers are picking on you all the time, don't you think it caused him some hurt and some pain? And he spent some time wondering, why don't I like to, to hunt and to gather and, and to do all of these things? Why do I just like to skip rocks? But if he had fallen prey to that pressure and said, okay, I'm not skipping rocks anymore. I'm not playing the harp anymore. My gosh, where would we be if we didn't have the majority of the book of Psalms? How many times do we go to Psalms for a pick me up or to worship our God, amen, or to feel a sense of joy or to be able to pour out our praises on God? We wouldn't have that if David had succumbed to that pressure. Joseph, Joseph was terribly misunderstood by his brothers, right? They didn't understand why his father favored him, so to speak. Joseph didn't understand why his father favored him. Joseph didn't understand the dreams that he was dreaming. So he wasn't understood by his family or himself, but he didn't let that diminish who he was. He still stood in his own truth. Amen. He still had to stand in his truth. He could very easily, when he was accused of, of um, being too forward with Pharaoh's wife, he could have succumbed to that pressure to stay out of jail and, you know, done a lot of different things, but he didn't. He stood in his truth. 
He did not allow pressure or misunderstanding to diminish who he was or his purpose because he knew he had that dream. Those dreams, he had the dream about the wheat, uh, the sheaves of wheat bowing down to him and the dream that the sun and the moon and all the stars bowed down to him. He had that dream and he stuck by his dream, not even totally understanding what it meant. But then when he was elevated, it all came to pass. It all came to fruition. And then he understood it because his purpose was being fulfilled. He was being positioned to help the very ones who hurt him so badly. Amen. So again, going back to Lady Iska here, <laughs> she has been misunderstood for over 4,000 years, right? Since the writing, whenever the, the first Dead uh, Sea Scrolls were written, she was misunderstood there because she just had one verse and there was not a lot told about her. But we know what her name meant and we know that she was in this particular family. But then the end all and be all of all of it is that our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, has been misunderstood throughout history, throughout history. He was misunderstood when he was prophesied about. He was misunderstood the 33 and a half years that he walked the face of this earth. Even by his own parents, he was misunderstood. And they knew that he was special. They knew that he was something special, right? Because the angel revealed that to both Gabriel, and, uh, revealed that to both Mary and Joseph, right? But they still didn't understand it completely because when he was 12 and he went to the synagogue and he got lost, um, well, they lost him. They lost Jesus. <laughs> lose Jesus, but they lost Jesus and they got scared, right? They didn't understand. Well, he's probably back at the synagogue because he's Jesus, amen, or, or Yeshua HaMashiach, that's that they would have called him, right? They lost him. So they went back and I'm sure they got upset and I'm sure he got in trouble, especially when he gave that, that smart alecky answer when he says, well, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? Can you imagine a 12-year-old telling you something? like that. <laughs> Amen. So they didn't even understand the, 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 the whole of his purpose, the complexity of his purpose that he was the Messiah prophesied about throughout history. So even Jesus was misunderstood. He tells us in his word, the world hates me, so surely it's going to hate you too. Right? Hate is a strong word, but that's what he said. <laughs> So when we talk about misunderstanding, let's not worry about any of that because we're in good company. We can't control what others think about us. What we can control is what we think about ourselves. And then we need to take that a step further is that we can control what we think about others. Amen. We should avoid jumping to conclusions um, which consequently leads to misunderstanding the beauty of the call on someone else's life. Amen. That's why the Lord tells us, judge not lest ye be judged. We don't know why they're a certain way. We don't know why they do things that they do. Right. Especially when we don't even understand why we do everything we do or why we like. Can anyone explain why you like your favorite food? Or why you enjoy your favorite kind of music? You just do. You can explain pieces of it. I love opera because I love the idea that someone can take a whole story and in the tone of their voice and in inflections and strength in some areas. And then, you know, the, the um, delicacy in some areas, I can explain why I like it. I can, exp no, I should say, I can explain the things I like about it, but I can't explain why it grabbed me at the beginning. When I first started really appreciate, appreciating it as a um, young teenager, I don't know why. When everyone else who was around me didn't, all of my, my friends, they didn't like it. They're like, well, there was, a young, there was a young lady who I went to high school with. And she had the most gorgeous voice. And she had started singing opera in different companies when we were in high school. 
And so every time I would see you, the first time I heard it, we were in madrigals together and the first, or I'm sorry, show choir together. And the first time I heard her after that, it was a done deal. And anytime I, I could get her, you know, in a space where it was kind of quiet and we weren't disturbing anybody, I said, you got to sing, you got to sing, you got to sing that. Where I had another friend who said to me later, would you stop asking her to sing? I cannot stand that kind of music. I'm like, are you kidding? This is like artwork in a voice. I don't understand what you don't like about this. But I can't tell you why I started appreciating it or what I like about it so much. It just, it's just in me. Amen. Why do some people like Picasso? Why do some people like Van Gogh? Some people like Renoir. Why? Can you explain it? Not a clue. Not a clue. It just grabs you. <laughs> Amen. 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 So we have to try to recognize that we don't even comprehend ourselves fully. So we can't comprehend, comprehend the next person uh, fully. And we don't want to diminish the call on their lives or get them to a place because everyone may not be as strong as us either. So we don't want to push someone to a place where they start doubting themselves and try to change into something they're not. And then they won't reach their full potential in Christ. So remember that Jesus was just so splendidly humble that he didn't demand that he be understood. He never demanded that people understand him. Can you think of anywhere in the word that he demanded? I need to be understood. You need to understand the totality of who I am. Not one place. But what he did was that he provided all of us the opportunity to get to know him and to get to understand him more. We'll never be able to understand him completely. But he provided the opportunity to get to understand him better through his scriptures, through prayer, and especially through worship. So if we help lead others to him, they'll understand him better. And then eventually they'll begin to understand us better in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word fills us up. We thank you, Lord, that your word explains just more and more each time we are able to really delve into it about who we are, about who we are in you, especially because it's our identity in you, Heavenly Father, that matters. But it's the same with our fellow brothers and sisters. It's their identity in you that matters, Lord. So let us be more patient. Let us be more kind, Heavenly Father, toward others. And then maybe if we show um, others more grace, Heavenly Father, they can show it to us as well. Understanding, Father God, that our purpose and our plan in you is not contingent upon being understood by anyone. Just like our salvation in you, Heavenly Father, is not contingent upon people understanding you wholly. We know that you offered your life for us and that's what we need to know. That's what we need to believe. That's what we need to hang on, that any hurt, that any pain, that any controversy, anything we feel, Father God, was all nailed to the cross with you and we can walk in freedom, complete freedom, because of you and who you are, Lord. This in all things, Father, we thank you for, we praise you for, and we worship you for in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Does anyone have any questions, any comments, anything they'd like to share? Anyone? Amen. I've got a question. Sure. Um. You mentioned um, that Jesus was also struggling with being misunderstood. So I think there's something, I'm trying to remember, I don't know if is two things are springing to mind. I think there's something that he had struggled with the disciples, because I think the disciples didn't understand him. And is there not something to do, I think I've seen it in a movie where he feels physically sick, in the morning and he had to go off I forgot what it was, it was I don't know if it was in the um, the Mel Gibson movie um, where when he start. was in the Garden of Gethsemane yeah, yeah. Do that. was that not to be misunderstood as well or something he was not only misunderstood but abandoned he felt abandoned which is another yeah. very human reaction that we have felt maybe from time to time um, what happened was it was he knew that it was time now 
that his time had come, that it was time for him now to lay down his life. And because he's all knowing, right? He, he's all knowing, he's all seeing. He knew because he's God, right? We've got the triune Godhead. He knew that it was not going to be anything easy. He knew that he had to actually endure the physical pain, that he had to endure the, the humiliation, that he had to endure everything he was going to have to endure. And so he went to the garden to pray and, and he became very human. At the, and I say that very loosely in quotes. I'm not trying to to diminish who God is, right? And who Christ is. But in that moment, he asked God, Lord, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me, if there's any other way. And he was so stressed out that he was sweating blood from his pores, which we know is a real physiological thing. This can happen to people. You know, if you look at case studies in psychology, you can see that this has happened where people have been stressed and have had anxiety to the point where blood has come from their pores. Because what happens is they're so tight, they're so full of anxiety that blood vessels burst. And that's what causes the blood to come through the pores. And that's why they say sweating blood. It's just that it's coming through your pores. Amen. So that's what was happening to him that night. And when he's going through all of these, not only physical trauma, but mental trauma, emotional trauma, spiritual trauma, the disciples fell asleep. These are his best friends here on earth. They fell asleep and he's sweating blood. And not only did they fall asleep when he's going through something, he's getting ready to go through this for them and for all of us. I'm going to take lashes, not, and when we, we say lashes, right? It, it was, these were strap, uh, what am I trying to say? Strips of leather with bone at the end that was hooked. Mm. So every time they hit, it would grab his flesh and, and kind of stick and pull it out. So it would look like our equivalent to ground meat when they finished giving him the 39 lashes. That's it would look like ground meat. You know, we see these pictures where there are these little bitty red marks. No, he was tortured. There is no person on this earth that will ever go through what he went through for us. And this was only after they put him in the, the, the cave or dungeon, what they call the prison at that time, put him in the cave locked in and they would take turns. They put a bag over his head and would take turns beating him in the face then demand that he tell them who hit you, who hit you. Then they put the bag over and hit him again. And they'd say, who hit you? Now he's Christ, he could have told them, but he did not cut any curves for us. He never cut any curves for us. This is after then they, they beat him, then they put the crown of thorns on him because they say, you say you're a king. You say you're the king of all. Let's make him a crown of thorns. And then they push that down on his head. But see what they understand, and I can go on about all the things that took place. What they did not understand is that these were all the things that had been prophesied about. All the places he bled were prophesied about. And they were all for a specific reason. They said, now we're getting into another sermon, so I'm not going to go <laughs> into all of that. But like the thorns, for instance, it just gets me excited when I talk about the word and how good God is toward us and how much he loves us. They didn't know when they were mocking him with thorns, what they were actually doing was they were facilitating the, the um, plan of God that he was taking back the work of the thorns. See, going back to the book of Genesis, when Adam had to now work in the thorns to get his food and all of that, when he was not in, the, when they got kicked out the garden, and now you will work for your food and your work in the thorns. Well, when he took those thorns, he took that back. That's what those thorns were about. So every single thing they thought they were doing to mock him, to humiliate him, to hurt him worse than they've hurt any other person, he was blessing us. And that plan was already in place. They didn't do anything to him that he didn't allow. Amen. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking with the misunderstood part, it's actually yeah. really interesting. Right. He was misunderstood. Other, other aspects of life. So to give you an example, so the person that started the TV or the light bulb was misunderstood. Yes. Until our good example is COVID vaccine misunderstood. Until Amen. The and they're always, they're always geniuses. That's a side of, side of a genius. Amen. And Amen. 
clap them at the end where they've mocked them during the whole course. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So again, we are in good company. Can you imagine Einstein walking around with that hair? And they had to say, what in the world is this coming? And they didn't know when he opened his mouth, genius was going to come out. <laughs> but they saw this wild hair coming toward them. Amen. Salvador Dali with his little mustache, the bicycle mustache, and he's got some of the greatest works of art that he's left us. But even those are misunderstood unless you know how to really get in and interpret them. Amen. Think about people in your own family that have been misunderstood, right? There are so many of us that would not be here at all to even be talking about this if our parents, many of us, had listened to what people may have said about them being united in marriage. <laughs> right? I know for a fact that, you know, in um, the African-American community, I'll use Reverend DeMont as an example. His grandmother was very, very fair, right? Very fair and had um, very fine hair. And because we explained this before, that, that paper bag um, theory, if you were darker than a paper bag, they didn't want you to marry into the family because they wanted everyone to be light. Well, his grandmother's family didn't want her to marry his granddad because he was darker complexion. And I think there was probably a part of her that intentionally did that. Of course, she was in love, but you want to rebel against things that are, that are foolish, the foolishness of the world, right? Now, imagine if, you know, Reverend DeMont weren't here. Again, I told you last time, I'd be in an RV by myself with a dog. <laughs> He wouldn't have been, you know, he wouldn't be here to give the word that he gives to people. He wouldn't be here to help all of those people that he's able to walk through um, the steps of strokes and stroke recovery and heart issues. He wouldn't be here to do that, you know, if, if his grandmother had succumbed to that pressure. But there was a whole lineage of people that had to come through her. Amen. And through his, his granddad. Amen. So don't worry about being misunderstood. Don't worry about people trying to lock you into a space that they can comprehend or try to simplify your walk to a degree that it makes it more relatable to them. It's not about them. And to, agree, to a degree, it's not about us. It's about God and his purpose and plan for all of our lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to add? Or any other questions? Thank you so much, Brother Frazier, for that, because that was, that was really good. Amen. Oh, yeah, he sent over, or Mozart, or, yep, the doppelganger.